Good morning, Lighthouse. Happy New Year. I think I was caught right in the middle of going between one place. Thank you, Richard. Going between one place and another, and uh, I realized that the time was upon us. It's great to be with all of you that are online this morning, and then there's just a handful of us, quite literally a handful of us here today, um, in, live in person. And some of that, I'm sure, is due to, I know a couple people are not feeling too well today. Others, it's just so cold. <laughs> um, and then they're, uh, but it, it's, it's all good, and, and you'll, you'll be able to uh, just enjoy the, um, yeah, the presence of God that we, have, that we have today. Hallelujah. Before we begin, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. And then um, uh, while I'm doing that, let me encourage you, if you haven't, those of you that are online, if you would, wouldn't mind downloading the uh, What's in Your Hand, uh, How to Prep Guide, the one that we've posted this week is the updated version. Um, so if you'll download that, and if you want to print it out, you're welcome to. But today we're going to be working with this insert that's in the middle. And so you can just, you can actually, for those of us that are present, if you want to go ahead and pull that insert out that's in the middle and set it to the side, um, the rest of this that we'll work with for the week you can just kind of put that off to the side there. And then we'll be working through, just walking through this uh, today briefly. Um, but before we get to all of that, uh, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. When we say Happy New Year to you, we're, I guess we're wishing the best for people as we approach something new, right? New in terms of time. And I think there's a lot of us that are hoping that 2020 and 2021 is behind us, and that 2022 boasts of something far greater than what we've walked through. Um, whatever the case, one thing about the, the, the Christian um, journey and walk is that our joy, our peace, um, our sense of love is not predicated upon whether the year was a good year or bad year or had suffering and challenging within it. Um, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ. I can go through difficult times and I can go through abundant times. Um, but with Christ, joy is always there. Peace is always available and love is always available. So with that in mind, I'm going to open up with a, it's with a reflection of prayer and, um, and orient our hearts and our minds toward God um, as we as we embark upon the first Sunday of 2022. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for 2021. Thank you for the highs, the lows, the difficulties, the challenges, the blessings and abundance, um, and the peace that was there constant, the joy that was available constantly, and the love that was all over us throughout 2021. And here we stand on um, the first, the second uh, day of the new year. It's, it's just fresh. It's, it's, it's in its infancy. And, um, and we're setting a precedent for ourselves that we want to be worshipers um, on these um, seventh, the, 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 the first day of the week. We want that to be a precedent for the rest of this year. So today we orient our hearts towards you. We rearrange the furniture in, in, in the uh, castle of our heart. We rearrange everything so that it faces you. You're at the center of it all. And we bless you in this and praise you in this. And we invite you to uh, let the alarm clock of our heart go off and awaken us um, to you. The smell of the coffee in the castle of God, the smell of you creating this ambiance of warmth and generosity and goodness. Uh, just do that. We embrace that here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Woo-woo! Well, here we are, 2022, first Sunday. We are in the, in the beginning of it all. I don't know what you all did for New Year's Eve or for New Year's Day, but I decided that I was going to celebrate New Year's Eve with the people of New York. That means that I went to bed at 9 o'clock. <laughs> I had all these wonderful intentions of getting up super early in the morning on New Year's Day and taking a hike, getting out kind of in the, in the nice warm sunshine, 
I wanted to hike to the top of Mount Tam. And so that was what I was going to do for New Year's Day. So I got to bed early. Well, I tried to, but you know how that is. You're trying to fall asleep, and it's just not happening. So as you get older, it doesn't happen as quickly as you would like for it to. Uh, but anyway, I got up early on, uh, on um, I think my alarm clock went off at 5 or 6. Uh, and then, like all wonderful, disciplined, rigorous people, I hit the snooze button and uh, went back to sleep <laughs> and was just waiting for it to get a little bit warmer. I was like, it's just too cold. Uh, but then finally got up and uh, headed up the mountain about 7.30 or so. Uh, with with my daughter, we both hiked to the top, had some wonderful conversation. Everybody was cheery, you know, Happy New Year. That's what people were saying coming up and down the the mountain. And and uh, man, those first few steps in the cold, I thought I was gonna, I thought I was gonna die. I was just like, it's so cold. I'm just, you know, I'm not in shape like I like I and fit like I thought. You know, well, not like I thought. I just I just wish I was in better shape. To make this, and I'm like <sighs> breathing heavy, really heavy, going up the mountain, sweating and perspiring. I'm just like, dear God, this was supposed to be like an invigorating hike. But then we got to the top um, of Mount Tam, s- sat down on the rocks there, the boulders right underneath the little the little hut, looked out over the Pacific Ocean, and then you have that like it's almost almost a 360 view, but of just everything around you, you know, the the city. The Bay, um, Berkeley, just all the way over to where you can almost see to Napa. You know, just you can just see everywhere. Sat there, and it just gave me a, a perspective. And so we sat there, and we talked for a little bit. And um, Drew was sharing with me, you know, she's wanting to go to grad school this year, and so she's got all these, I, all these, these dreams and things that she's reaching for. And I was cheering her on, and she's filled out her applications and. Um, we talked about that a little bit, and then we started down the mountain. On the way down the mountain, I had, uh, I, I just asked her, she's, she's got this uh, intuitive sense about her where she can, you know, sense, I, I remember before 2020 happened, this will give you an idea, before 2020 happened to us, <laughs> she, she said to me, you know, I think this is going to be a rough year. And I was like, ah. Now, I was thinking individually, like maybe it's going to be rough for her. You'll get through it. She goes, no, I just think this is going to be a rough one. I was like, okay. So we're walking down the mountain, and with that in mind, I'm like, hey, how do you feel about 2022? <laughs> like, do I need to get prepared? Do I need to get a bunker somewhere? Like, what's going to happen? <laughs> um, and she was like, you know, I, I just, I don't, I don't have a sense, you know, about, about it. We just kind of talked about that. And, and then she, you know, I said something to her to the effect of, you know, what, um, like, what are your goals or your, your dreams beyond, you know, a plan for school and um, what kind of, oh, speaking of which, what kind of came from that, from that conversation was we began to talk about we have no control over the events, the things that happen in the world around us, right? I, we can't, I can't control what the stock market does. I can't control what happens in w- whether there's a pandemic or a fire or whatever. We have no control over those things. But we do have control over the kind of people that we are. We, do ha- we, we can control the kind of person we are going to be in this world. And that is probably the most important responsibility that we have. And so with that in mind, I want to I want to just direct your attention for just like a couple of minutes and then we're going to spend a little bit of time doing some exercises here with the um, uh, with, with this hand. So if you have that handout, a few of you have just come in. If you'll take the center, the center piece, you can just take it out and uh, and we'll be working with that uh, here in a moment. Um, uh, but I, I want to I want to direct your attention to the book of 2 Corinthians, this is, this is a letter that was written by Paul. You know, you know that if you have to have a second letter, the first letter probably didn't go along so well. So, you know, if you've ever had to, like, text someone and then they respond, that's not the right response, you have to text them again about the same thing. This is kind of the thing that's going on with Paul. He writes them a long letter, it's called 1 Corinthians, and then they don't respond well 
And so he's got to write another letter. And when you get to the end of the second letter, he's like, you know what, shoot, forget it. I'm just going to have to come visit you guys because you're not getting what I'm saying. And basically, just in a, in a nutshell, what's going on with this group of people, they live in Corinth, which is a city in the, in the Greco-Roman world. Um, it's a city that ha- has a culture of rhetoric, a culture of, of uh, Aristotle's persuasive speeches. So they give a lot of these... The sophists would, get, would give a lot of speeches, and, and, um, and they would get very sectarian, you might say, uh, divisive. They would get in these little groups. And so the body of Christ was supposed to be a group of people that are unified, that are together, that are, that are at one. And what happened to this, this particular church is that everybody broke off into factions. They're fighting each other. They're saying, I'm better because this person baptized me and that person baptized you, so you're not as good as me. They break up into groups of, well, my gifts are better than your gifts. I'm smarter. I'm more. And so you had all these little groups in the city of people that were just constantly nitpicking, gossiping, fighting, arguing amongst themselves, walking around with attitudes of elitism, attitudes of, of, of smuggery, if that's a smugness. <laughs> they, they were just kind of giving themselves over to this. And Paul continues to try to correct this, and it just doesn't come across well. Well, by the time we get to the second letter, I'm going to look at the, the, uh, the, fifth, the fifth chapter of the second letter of Corinthians. And, and in, in the first part of this chapter, in verse 9, Paul, Paul is trying to express to them like what his desire is. And, and he says to them, you know, we make it our goal to please him, to please God, uh, specifically to please Jesus Christ. He's like, our goal in all of this, the reason why we do what we do, the reason why we act how we act, the reason why we came to you and shared this message was that we wanted, with every, everything within us, we wanted just to please, to please Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look, uh, if you look at the uh, kind of the end of this of this paragraph in verse 10, he says, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ, a judgment seat was like, have this picture of the Caesars. They would sit in these seats and in the gladiator games, right? The gladiator games are being played and they'd get the thumbs up and the thumbs down. And the the person sitting there said, I like this. I don't like this, right? Um, We talked about that. That gets talked about in one of our devotionals, I think on Monday this week. Um, so all of us, Paul says, he's using that as a metaphor, all of us will appear before the, the Bema seat of, of Christ. It's this seat where we all stand in the arena, like the gladiator arena, and our life is held into account. How we lived it, how we treated others, were we loving and kind, were we mean and, and vindictive, all of that will be brought into account. And we'll get the thumbs up or the thumbs down as we stand in that space. So he says we're living our life in this attempt, in this goal, to please the one that sits in, in the arena. We don't care about Caesar. We don't care about these other people, but it's Christ that we want to please. And then he moves beautifully into this um, next flow, beginning in verse 11. He says, since then, since we live with this passion, so to speak, um, to please God, um, we know what it is to fear the Lord, or we know what it means to fear the Lord, might be another way of saying that, or we know what the fear of the Lord is. In other words, we are so in awe, we are so amazed by, we are so, uh, we stand in such wonder of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. He says that, that um, we try to persuade people. Now, most of us, this word is going to get complete, it gets completely lost on people in the West, uh, especially now that we're, you know, two millennia removed from what Paul was attempting to do. The word persuade really is connected to the word for rhetoric, to, 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 to give out these, um, rhetor, to give out these arguments, these persuasive speeches was a part of that culture, just like TikTok or or Instagram, or uh, Snapchat, or some of these apps are ways that people communicate, and they kind of, they're all caught up in that. In that world, rhetoric was kind of like the, whatever, the Facebook, it was a social media of its day. And the people would get up, 
at the, at, at the uh, gates of the city or at the center of the town of the city, and they would have these great speeches. And, and you would listen to the speech, and the person would try to persuade you to something. Now, there, were, there was one group of individuals that had to use all the principles of rhetoric. And rhetoric comes from Aristotle. He was the one that kind of originated this idea of persuasive speeches, and it was a culture, it was a vibe, it was, a, it was an art, an art form, and a science form as well. Um, and there were, there were basically, ambassadors were the people that had to have mastered all the tools of rhetoric. If you were an ambassador, you had to use every single tool of, of rhetoric. And there were, there were essentially three, three kinds of rhetoric, and then there were five, uh, there, were, there were three elements of persuasive speech. And Paul uses this throughout his letters. And we miss it because we, this isn't part of our training. But when you read Paul, you realize this guy, which we know now, he had the equivalent of two PhDs. He was a philosopher, a theologian. He was absolutely brilliant. It's just we don't have the context of what he's working with to really appreciate what he's saying. But there were, there were basically three, uh, three types of, of rhetoric. There was the epidietic, which was which was to get someone that would use rhetoric, they would get in and they would give praise. And so you could walk in and you would say something, oh, great and mighty Caesar, who has conquered the world with that, and you would just give all lavish praise and just go on and on and on as a way of kind of getting them to swoon and be persuaded. And we call this in our world today flattery. You know, you can tell when someone's being giving you flattery and they don't really mean what they're saying, they're just saying it because they have an agenda right? Well, this was a form of rhetoric, right? And uh, ambassadors had to have this skill worked because they would have to stand before like a Caesar or someone and use this to persuade them. And they would have to, and it had to, it had to really be filled with all the adjectives and all the, you know, the, the kind of the pump uh, that, would, that would go with that. Then there was a, another one that was called uh, deliberative. And the deliberative uh, form of rhetoric was you would make an appeal to someone based upon like there's a future action that you need to take and if you don't take this this will be the consequence of that so you need to make a decision for this and act on this because if you don't save your money if you don't whatever da, 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 you will be blankety blank 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 and then they would argue and argue and argue that right and so there were some there were some uh uh, rhetoric, uh, re some of those that, that gave, to gave themselves over to, to rhetoric that would use that as their argument. And then there was another one, and this other one is called forensic, uh, uh, forensic rhetoric, and it was, you would take a policy that the Caesar had come up or that was a part of the Roman Senate, you would take some policy that was a part of that city, and you would defend it. And it was like an apologetic. You stood there, you defended that, you gave all the reasons why a person should follow this policy, follow this initiative, live this out. And an ambassador had to have the gift of being able, uh, the skill of being able to use all three of these interchangeably. At the end of this, Paul is going to say, I am an ambassador of Christ. And I am using persuasion and the elements of persuasion for heaven of which I am a citizen. And I am arguing to the citizens of earth that there is a better, a better city, a better way to live. And so he'll use these elements of persuasive speech. In fact, you get another look into Aristotle's elements of persuasive speech in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter, five, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul says, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, I didn't come to you just merely, he said, but I came, I didn't come to you merely with words, logos, and I didn't come to you simply with, uh, he uses the three elements of, of Aristotle's speech, which are logos, pathos, and ethos. It wasn't just the ethic of my life, it wasn't just the passion that I spoke with, and it wasn't just the content, but he said, I came in dunamis in the power of the Spirit. So he said, I'm using all of this. I'm using logos. I'm using pathos. I'm using the ethos of my life, the ethic that I live to. And I depend upon the Spirit's power at work in all of that. Now, whew, that's a lot. We'll get, we're getting that. We're tracking here. Watch what he says next. He says, what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. 
Paul is saying that the kind of people that we are is what really matters. It's not all the other stuff. It's not what it appears. It's not the appearance. It's not the show. It's not the display. It's the kind of person that you are. And this is what he's going to kind of work through and argue with right here as he's making his case. Um, He says, We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is heard. (laughs) This is great. The sophists were uh, rhetoricians that they would focus on the outward display of everything. The sophists would say it's, it's, the, it's the clothes that you're wearing. Like, this is how you win an argument. You want to persuade people, wear the right clothes, have, have an appearance, like be in style, be trending, and you'll win an argument, and then have, have the right um, delivery. You know, if, if, if the right delivery at that time was the way, you, <laughs> the way you did your hand or the way you shook your hair or you have the right delivery and then it was the texture of your voice. And so some people, well, you just can't be, you can't do rhetoric because you don't have the right texture. And it was all externals. For the clothing, it was the wealthy appearance. And, and listen, lest we think that this is something that was just archaic and it doesn't affect us today. I'm telling you, most of us think that someone is legitimate, that they are, they speak the truth, they've they've got it all together, and I should listen to what they say because they have 100,000 followers on social media, or because they're wealthy, and they have, they drive the right car, and they have the right clothing, and and we look at that, and immediately, we don't even hear what they've said so far. We just look at that, and we go, whatever they say, it must be true. Or if you're like me, you look at someone and they might have a PhD, a DD, uh, you know, a a whatever, a JD. You know, they have whatever it is behind their name. And I'm like, they must know what they're talking about. They've got the education. They went to Harvard. They went to Oxford. I mean, all right, I'll follow you. (laughs) Right? It can be a lot of things that we may find ourselves swooned by. That's external. It's not the heart. It's all these external things. And Paul's saying this here. He's saying, you know, um, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, then he goes on and talks about this. Now watch it in verse 14. He says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. This is, this is absolutely, absolutely, it's, it's brilliant. He is saying, essentially, that, that what happens when a person becomes um, enthralled in deep reverence of God's love for us in Jesus Christ is it completely upends the way that we lived before. Like when you, when you, when down in here, not just know it, but when da- if down here you really believe you're loved, like loved so much that, that Christ's death is, be, is if you were the only person alive, Christ, Christ's death would have happened just so you would know that Christ goes before you into death, that Christ is with you, that you are not alone. Like when you know that that kind of love is what is over your life, it completely changes the way that you would live for, I need this, I need that, I, I need so, someone's approval, I need this material and this stuff to make me happy, I need to be in control of this thing over here, I need to control the outcomes, I, 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 you're living for that, and all of a sudden you realize God loves you so much, and he, God is just lavishing you with love, and it's like that upends that whole false empty quest of living to just pursuing needs primitive needs you you don't have to do that anymore and and so then and so then paul says so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view he says 
because this love has transformed who we are, I, we're no longer looking at people saying, oh, they, they must be legitimate because they've got a lot of money. Or they must be legitimate because, they, you know, because they're connected to the who's who of the what's what. Or they must be special, and I should listen to everything they say, and I should follow everything they're calling me to follow. He says, no longer. We don't do that anymore. Something happened to our heart. We just don't judge that way. We, we, we don't judge after the flesh, after the world, after this worldly point of view. The world does that, but we don't do that. Hmm. Though we once regarded Christ in this way. What does that mean? It means there was a point when we looked at Jesus and we said, oh, he's just, he's just a, a homeless vagabond. He's just, he doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any weight or any worth. He's just, this is what Paul's saying. Like, this was Paul's view. He's, I, there was once where I lived, I was like, that man, he, he's a peasant. He didn't go to the schools that I went to. He never went to school. Paul went to school, several schools. He said, there was a time when I looked at Jesus like he's a nobody. He doesn't, he doesn't amount really to anything in the world's estimation of how you value things. What school did you go to? How much money do you have? What clothes do you wear? He only had one pair of clothes. You know, he, he didn't even have a home. I mean, he lived up in Galilee. He wasn't even in the hub of where life happens in Jerusalem. This guy's like, he's not even in the suburbs. This guy lives out in the country, in Podunkville. Like, who is he? Right? Right? There was a time when we looked at him. Isaiah says, for those of you getting ready to study Isaiah, Isaiah says, when we looked upon him, we thought he was nothing. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. We thought this guy's vision, this guy's visage, his appearance is so bland. He must be under the judgment of God. That's what we thought. That's what Isaiah says. So he says, even though we thought that way of Christ, we don't do that any longer. Now, here's the verse this all builds to, and this is a beautiful verse as we kick off this year. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. If anyone is in Christ, what does he mean by in Christ? Once anyone has felt this love and they are in love with Christ and they sense that Christ is in love with them, the old goes. It just goes. You just don't judge people that way anymore. You don't live under that condemnation anymore. You don't feel the pressure of that anymore. He says, it's a new world. It's like for the first time in your life, you're not living based upon neediness, based upon all the needs that you think you have to have, or all the, 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 the um, limiting beliefs that seem to plague us for so much of our lives. All of a sudden, you're free from that. And you're a new I love this creation. This is this was the idea of the gospel of part of the, the idea of the gospel of John was that we could use it in terms of the language of evolution that when what Christ did on the cross evolved the human race into there was a new act of creation that happened. Something new was created. We are that new creation. And there's no going back. It's here. It's here to stay. So, that was just a way of kind of reflecting on it's a new year. It's a new season. Everything is new. And it's new because of Christ. You are new. Paul says, so... He'll go on to say, so God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. He says, all I do now is I walk around trying to persuade people that, they are, that God is madly in love with them. And I try to get them to be reconciled to God. Because they've been living as though their life isn't worth living. They've been living as though they have to fight, scratch, claw, bite, dog eat dog world, survival of the fit. They've been living that way. And he says, I'm coming on the scene going, there's another way. You can live as though you are loved, and that's the truth. You are loved by God. 
And he says, so that's the ministry we've been given. It's a ministry of reconciliation. And then he gives this beautiful image. He says, for it is Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And now Christ. six or seven years ago, and um, I was illustrating the, uh, the Lord's Supper, like communion, and I had some bread in my hand, and I was just walking around how, I was talking about how, how salvation is as easy as taking a bite of bread and taking a swallow of, of grape juice, right? It's that easy, like that's what I was saying. Like, it's something you receive. It's not something you work for, earn, merit. It's just something you receive. I'm walking, I come right here. I'm standing right here holding this piece of bread out. And there's a visitor that's sitting, like, right here. And this visitor, um, I just love how Richard is just so gracious in his little dance across the floor. <laughs> there was somebody sitting right here, and um, she was a visitor. I had never, it was her first time here. I'm walking around, I'm just kind of holding out the bread, not to give to anyone, but just to illustrate. You know, Christ holds out the bread to us and says, you know, here, take, eat, right? Um, uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Kind of like doing that, right? But I'm not giving it to anyone. So I, I stand right here, and, I, and I'm like doing this, and this lady sitting here reaches her hand up to take it from me. And I was just like, oh, that's kind of, well, I wasn't planning on giving it out. But then everything, everything went just slow motion. It was like the whole room stopped. You ever seen those, those films where or movies like everything, everything freezes except for one person and they're like walking around, you know, and everything, it, it felt like everything froze. And then, and then I felt like I was being, I was, my consciousness was pulled out of my body. Like I was outside of me watching me. And, and then I looked at me, my hands, my, my body, and I could see Christ, the energy of Christ, inside of me, just like in, in me. And I was like, I was like, for a moment, for a split second, I was like, I'm not even, I'm not as in control of me as I think I am. <laughs> and then the hand went out, she took the bread, brought it back, and then it was over. I went on, and I just kept thinking, that's so weird, that's so weird. Finished the service, wrapped it up at the end of the service, she walks up to me. She introduces herself to me. She says, hi, I'm so-and-so. Um, I hope it was okay that I took that bread today. I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. She said, well, I'm not a Christian. And, and she said, I, I know that like, it's only probably for Christians to have the bread. She goes, I'm, I'm a deeply committed Buddhist. Um, but when you held it out, I had a vision that Christ was in you. And I was like, okay stop right there and so then I stopped and I shared with her what my experience was and I said look I have what happened was between you and Jesus God bless you that's beautiful she goes yeah and when I took that something happened to me in that moment now when we talk about the that we are called to do the work of reconciliation that might be like an extreme way of thinking of, of it, but really, Christ is in us, plural, reconciling the world to himself. 
And, and whether that is passing out socks, um, sharing a meal with someone, smiling to someone as you walk down the street, and smiling with the intent of, I just want Christ to smile upon this person, so I'm going to let my muscles yield themselves to, to Christ's flow. Whatever it is, small, simple, those small, simple acts become actually opportunities for the greatness of Christ to impact a single moment. And, um, and for us to actually to kind of flesh out what it means to be that new creation that we're called to. So what I would uh, like us to do right now is we're going to take a moment. I'm going to work through, work through this hand with you all. Um, last week online, we, we talked about uh, Jesus coming, preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Repent and receive the good news. So we're using the hand as a metaphor for the nearness of God's kingdom, that it is at hand. And we also know because Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. So the hand is maybe a metaphor for access points to the kingdom of God that is within us so that we can experience the full life-giving transformation of the Spirit. On, on the front page, you have, you have a, a blank hand. On the back page, you have a couple of examples. One's from Deborah, one's from myself, of kind of how we, we did this this week and what we came up with for ourselves. So you can see there's some examples there, just if you're kind of stumped and you're like, well, give me an example of what that might be. Um, but that, doesn't, that also doesn't mean that you have to follow it the way that we follow it because we're all so unique and different, you can come up with your own way of kind of following it. Um, but what we're going to do this first week of, of uh, January, the first full week beginning tomorrow, is we're going to work through this hand together as, as a community. So on Monday, we'll work with the thumb. On Tuesday, we'll work with the index finger, then the middle finger on Wednesday. Thursday will be the, the ring finger, and Friday, the pinky. And then on Saturday, the, the whole hand. Um, so you'll have a, you have a tool there that you, can, that you can work through as you just reflect on that internal work of the Spirit in your life to become the kind of person that really models or exemplifies Christ uh, in, in your world. Now, um, also, by the way, if I could just, I'll just add to this and then I'm going to set you free for about 10 or 15 minutes or so to just begin to kind of write in there. Um, if I could just also say with all of that, I got so inspired about this this week. Folks, just pumped up and inspired and excited that I straight up did a seven-day seven podcast on guided meditations through the hand. And I have posted them. They're on our app, which is free. They're on our app, the SF Lighthouse app. It's free. You can download that app. And under podcast, you have day one, day two, day three, day four, day, all the way through. You have the thumb, the finger, all right? You can work through those. They're about 10 minutes, maybe, maybe eight minutes to kind of move up to about 12 because we're, what we're doing, folks, aren't you just ex as, ex as excited as me? <laughs> what we're doing is I'm going to guide you into sitting in, the, in, the, in silence with God being present with God, and we're, we're working our way up from one minute of silence all the way up to seven minutes of silence. So on day one, we do one minute of silence, and I guide you through that, and then in day seven, I guide you through seven minutes of, of silence. And then, and then I kind of share with you a little bit of the outcome of that. So they're really short. You can download it. You can listen to them. Um, and it's just kind of a way of, of getting you... Um, you know, the image, the imagery that I have is when, when, when people that run track, when they get down in the, in the blocks, you know, it's like, it's like you're readying yourself for a race, and, and the blocks serve as kind of, they, they serve as leverage for you. The stance serves as kind of like this is the best place to burst forth with speed, right? I'm, I'm wanting to provide you with some tools so that you can run the race of 2022 from the right position with the right leverage, Right? These, that, that's kind of the imagery that I, that I have here. So uh, you'll be able to get that. If you don't have a smartphone device, 
and you don't, you're not able to access that, you can email us, and then I'll actually send you the links. Um, just send them to you, the files, and you can just do that on your own. So no worries if you don't, if you don't have that. If you don't have a computer, then we'll figure out what, what you do have. If it's an 8-track, if it's a cassette tape, if it's an LP, we'll figure it out, and we'll somehow record it for you so that you have it. There will be no excuse for you not being able to get it if you really want it. All right, so let's look, look at this hand right now for a moment. And uh, you'll, you'll notice right here the thumb says, what am I grateful for? And what we're trying to begin with here is just kind of that sense and that feeling of, um, of there's so much good in my life. Even though I may be facing a challenge or something, there's so much good that's worth being grateful for. And if I'm going to begin this journey into that interior castle of God's kingdom, I'm going to do that by first hearing good news. Jesus begins with good news. There's something in your life that God is doing, has done. We can even look at what Paul talked about here. It's For Paul, it's even the awareness that Christ loves us so much. That might be the thing that you're grateful for. And um, so you could, you could write that down there. But I want to take here maybe 10 minutes or so. Do we have any, any music we could upload and play while, while people are? It could be something worshipful or something inspirational. And um, what you'll do is you just kind of go through these, these, these questions. And the, the two that I'm like most interested in here today is... The first one, the thumb, and then the index finger. And you don't have to worry about filling out the rest. You, you, you can get some time to do that. We explain them in detail uh, in, the, in the little booklet that you have. But um, those first two, what am I thankful for, grateful for? Another possibility is you could look back over 2021 and identify something from last year. Like the, the most significant gratitude you, you have because of 2021. Um, you could write that down there. Um, and then you can write just, what does gratitude feel like? Like, just take some time to, like, think that. And then the index finger is, is you're looking, now you're looking ahead to 2022, and you're asking yourself, what kind of person do I want to become this year? When I look at Jesus, when I look at um, the presence of Christ, what is it that's in Christ that I want to come out of me in my life? Uh, so yeah, we'll take a couple minutes. For those of you online, you can do the same thing. Uh, you can download this, this file. We're not having a discussion here. We'll just download this file. Or if you want to just type in your notes in response to that question, those two questions, what am I grateful for from 2021? And then as it relates to 2022, what kind of a person uh, do I want to become? And we'll take, like I said, 10 minutes here, and then we're going we're gonna to circle back and just have a moment of surrendering these, um, these reflections to God. And for those of you that are on our newsletter email list, all of this stuff has been emailed out as well. Links to the podcast, um, this information is downloadable. You can download it. Um, that's all in the uh, newsletter that we send out weekly. So you can get it there in addition to, to here. It's also on our website. That was the wake-up call. That was the sound of the...
bassoon, is that what you call it, in a symphony? We're still in the spirit of Christmas. <laughs>
have like a Christmas a Christmas mix? <laughs> that's that's fine. We're good. We're all good. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, while we're all, I'm sure we're all kind of wrapping it up here. I think it's been about ten minutes or so. I would like you to look at that with your thumb that you that you have there, the things you wrote down next to your thumb. All right. If you, if you could only put, if you could only have one word that captures all the things that you wrote that you were thankful for or grateful for, what would that word be? If there was just one word. Sobriety. Sobriety. Breath. Breath. Oh, love it. Help. New, good, alive. alive. I love it. I love it. If you're online, you can type that in. That one word that it just summarizes everything that you you're grateful, grateful for. All right. Look at the index finger. Let's do the same the same thing with that. The same thing with the index finger. This is the kind of person that you want to be. If you could just if there was one word that symbolized. The, what you sense this next year you're reaching for or, or you see yourself. It's kind of like it's, it's, it's the, the you on the horizon. My dad used to say something to me as a kid. He would say, or as I got, as a young adult, he would say, the person you are today owes it to the person you're going to become to take care of yourself. He would say it like this, the 80-year-old you, Jeff, owes it to the 30-year-old you. The 30-year-old you owes it to the 80-year-old you to take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Treat yourself. Because that 80-year-old depends on your kindness now. Same kind of thing. as You're pointing your finger to the person you're going to become, and you're wanting to connect these two, the person I am today, to the person that I'm becoming, that I see Christ. So one word. What would you say? Index finger. Love. Just as common as that. <laughs> that's a common one, but try it. Yeah. Oh. People, More love. People, oh. Most people always, oh, love, 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 love. Do, be that demonstration of love. Oh, yeah. Patience. That's Patience. Yeah, that's okay. okay. <laughs> you know, if you think of the fruit of the Spirit, one love, way, just as... Yeah. Yes. So, it's not fruits... It's fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and then everything else that follows is a description of what love is. Joy, peace, patience. And so if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, it has all of those descriptions in there. Love is patient. Love is kind, right? It goes through all that. Love is truthful, faithful, right? Beautiful. So patience, love, hopefulness, and that's beautiful. Hopefulness. Kindness. I love that. I love that. Kindness. To abide. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, that's a reflection on John, John 17, right? John 6, 15. Yep, that beautiful abide in me and I in you. Love it. Humility. Humbleness. Yeah. I mean, everything that's being mentioned here, we see in Jesus. Yeah. We see this in Jesus when we look at Jesus. Richard, do you have anything? Trust. Trust. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Trust. Yeah. Yep. I love it. I love it. Um, and for those of you that are online, uh, you can just type in one word. What would it be? Do we have anything popping up there? Okay. Um, so I want to give just a little bit of reflection on this seven-day meditation that, that, that I, I put together for you. This past week, I took one day out of the week, and I would do each one to guide you. I want to give you just a little bit of reflection on it. So my idea behind this was this. I, I wouldn't say it was an idea. It just was an inspiration that I had last week that, that I wanted to... Let me, let me take a step back and say it like this. I recognize... There are things, because of the pandemic, because of our current 
situation, there are things that we can't provide that we used to be able to provide for us as worshipers. That said, not to be limited, there are things that we can now provide that we just didn't provide before. For example, being able to put together just five to ten minute daily guided meditations, guiding you into Christ's presence, like, like, why not? Like, we can do that. So that was part of the part of my thinking behind it. The second thing I want to just say is I, I feel the Spirit is calling me to be held accountable for guiding us into prayer, a contemplative life, a life that is centered in God's presence daily, not just on Sundays, but daily. And so I wanted to help guide us. A lot, of, a lot of research, a lot of study has gone into this for years, that if a person would just meditate 20 minutes a day, like it will balance out and counteract so much of the other negative stuff that goes on in your life. So I wanted to guide you into 20 minutes, starting with one minute and then building our way up to that over 20 days. So it's going to be you and me together doing this. I'm going to be with you. We're going to do this. We're going to grow this together. And it doesn't mean that we have to be perfect at it because none of us will be. It just means that we are yielding and surrendering ourselves to God. So this week, it's going to be, it's pretty easy. It's one minute, then two, then three. And I'm just, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you the whole way. We're in this together. You're not alone. Um, but as a way of like, I want to start my year out grounding myself in God. Grounding myself in, in, in Christ's presence. And so that's, that's where my, what my hope is for this, for the meditation. The meditation goes along with this booklet. So when we, when we go to, when you read day one and you fill out day one over here, you know, within probably 20 minutes, you can, you can do this in the morning, do something else in the afternoon, whatever. Then you go on and you listen to the, to the podcast, they go together. They just kind of work together. And I think what you, I don't, I mean, my, I have a strong sense. What you're going to discover is there is a depth of something happening in you that an awakening, an awareness of the nearness of Christ's presence that's, that's just at work in you, at work in your life. And, um, and I, I, I just think when we come back next week, it's going to be beautiful just to hear what you're experiencing, what, what it was like, both the challenges, because it can be challenging, right? The challenges, the difficulty you had. And I, as I'm doing this with you, I'll debrief with you on the, on the podcast, and I'll tell with you, like, yeah, in fact, in one of my podcasts, I'm like, okay, I just spent three minutes, and I not once really got myself wrapped around thinking about God. <laughs> you know, and so I share with you just my challenge with it. But then I explain the hope of that is that I am presenting, creating a moment, you know, for that. So um, in, 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 in the spirit of what we talked about here with Paul, if anyone is in Christ, he, she, is a new creation, the old is past, the new has come. In the spirit of that, I think I would like, I want to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to swoosh in here, if, you, if I could use that language, and take this from kind of that cerebral, heady space, emotive kind of filly touchy space and take it into a place of supernatural miraculous working this is a reality beyond of our thinking beyond our feeling you know b beyond what we can touch and what's physical it's a reality of god that works and flows through all of that and when, that, when the Holy Spirit is at work, the scripture says, you know, he who has begun a good work in you finishes it. He completes it all the way until the last day. So when, when Christ begins a work in you, 
He's going to complete and finish. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit, that work of transformation that, that's happening in our lives. Um, so think of, as, as you think of that work that you mentioned, that one word that represents the transformation, love, patience, hope, kindness, right, humility, faith, these, these words, it represents probably something that's a lot more detailed, like you know the details of how you want to see that play out in your life. As you think of that, and as you think of how in the past it's been difficult for you just to try to do that on your own, you know, to try to just be a loving person on your own is just, and so you can think of like, you know, things in your head, and then where you're wanting the transformation to happen and come, here's what we're going to do. I want you just to imagine your heart being opened up to the Holy Spirit to come within and begin doing that work miraculously, supernaturally. Not your effort, not your willpower, not your determination. It's just all you can do is surrender and open and trust the Holy Spirit will do this in me. Why? Because you are loved. That's why. You're you're his child. That's why. You mean the world to him. Because you're taking the time just to be present right now for crying out loud. You've braved the cold elements. You're all bundled up. Or if you're online, you're, you've resisted the urge to watch the news, watch whatever it is. And you're like, I want God's presence. You're here. That tells me that God's at work in you. You we, could, we couldn't even be, I couldn't be here if Christ wasn't at work in me. Christ is, if, and if, if Christ is at work, whew, what does that say to what's going to happen this year in your life miraculously, supernaturally? It's going to happen. So now your heart's open, and you're imagining, imagining the Spirit come in. If you, if you imagine it like a dove or like a rushing mighty wind or imagining it like, like water, like an artesian well that's gurgling with life and gurgling with, with just the flow. Or if you imagine Jesus breathing over you and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you into the world. And you just, you're experiencing this right now. Father, we are so wide open to you. We know that we cannot do this on our own. So we surrender to you and we say, come, breathe love into our heart. Breathe hope into our heart. Breathe kindness into our heart. Breathe that abiding, waiting, living with God in our heart. Breathe it miraculously, supernaturally, powerfully, that it is not, it is not by might and it is not by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Breathe that into us, for if anyone is in Christ Jesus, she, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become brand spanking new. We are new in you. We are alive in you. We step into this year with the the hope that Christ is in us and glory upon glory upon glory, beauty upon beauty upon beauty, courage upon courage upon courage, faith to faith to faith. We are walking with you inside of us. And we receive this miracle. We receive this supernatural transference of your power, of your will, of your authority, of your joy inside of our life. We receive it right now. We breathe it in. Not even our doubts can chase you away. Not even our weaknesses can chase you away. It is written in your word that when we are weak, you are strong. Not even our fears can chase you away. We just orient them towards you, fearing you, loving you, surrendering to you. And now we just put a big yes, an exclamation mark upon all of that. Yes, 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 
yes. In Jesus' name, we hold all of this open before you. We thank you. We thank you. We feel clean. We feel inspired. We feel hopeful. Mm, we feel as though we're about to discover something we've never discovered before. We feel you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo. How do you feel? Relaxed. <laughs> Glory. Oh. Tina's got this glow all over her right now. She's just smiling in the glow of God. Look, she's just got this glow, this glowishness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amen. Before I, you know, take us to announcements and um, uh, and send us out, send us out with a benediction. Any any questions, uh, uh, comments, thoughts, just from what we walked through here today. It could be logistical about, you know, the things that some of the tools are making available to you. It could be that. It could be about the content we walk through. It could just be just you affirming what you sense God's doing in your heart. Thank you for sharing that, Rhonda. I think that's, yeah, excited, excited. Yeah, Rhonda just said that she's excited about, she doesn't do New Year's resolutions, but she does try to get, she does get a vision of like what God's going to do or what she wants God to do in and through, through her. And so she said that she's spending some time with her, with her family today and just talking through some of this uh, and just sharing through, you know, kind of the, the vision that, that, that she has. And she, the word that she, that she had was she was excited, just really excited. Yes, we certainly can. Father, I bless Rhonda. I bless her, her daughters, her grandchildren. I, bl I bless them with just an, an, an awakened heart to what you're up to in their lives and that your presence would just be tangible uh, like they would even hear those comments surely the lord is in this place surely god is in what we're doing right now that there would be that because where that is that's all that's needed and so i just ask that you'd give that that clarity that comes with your spirit bless them just bless them and uh, ask asking these things in jesus's name amen Were you raising your hand or you just, okay, yeah. Just, yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else? Very good. Very good. All right, well, uh, as, as, as far as announcements go, um, I think the things that were super important that I share with you had to do with the app and being able to download that if you have any questions and you're not able to get it or it's just not working out well for you, text us so that we can like figure it out. This is my this is actually the first time for me to do this. And so I'm I'm kind of trying to figure it out as I go along as well. Um, if you have yeah, any questions about that, just let us know. Um, in addition to that.
yeah, with updates on. So the idea here for like this month, the first 21 days, and you could do this. And I have I have uh, a couple of friends that do in da- in January they do, they do the Daniel fast. So they take 21 days and they do a Daniel fast. And you could Google that. And there's a lot of different ways you you that it can be done. But um, some people will start out by cutting out all all like sugar, flour, that kind of stuff for a week, and then they move on to cutting out. Uh, other things that they may, you know, but it, from their food sources, and they just kind of work towards a juice diet or, or a, um, you know, veg- vegetable only or something. Some people say well, it's not about food for me. It's about social media. It's about not watching the news. It's about, you know, just kind of that's what I want to focus on. That's beautiful too, all of it. This could be a supplement to something like that. So this is really oriented around the, the 21 days that we're working through is oriented around developing a contemplative life, a, 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 a meditation practice in scripture, in, G, in, in, in uh, the, the voice of Christ, and sitting in the silence and the stillness. I sense, especially for us that live in the Bay Area, there's so much noise pollution, so much vying for our attention, from everything from billboards to social media to... That to create a space of silence where you can just sit and be still is probably one of the more valuable things that we can do in our world. And so I wanted, I wanted to help guide you because I, I've had people say, there's no way I could do that. There's no way I could do 20 minutes. There's no, and I'm like, could you do a minute? Well, if someone helps me, all right, I'm going to help. Could you do maybe two? And I'll help you in what to think about and reflect on for just two minutes. Okay, I'll try two. And, I, and then for me to guide you all the way to, to 20 minutes is, was my vision for this. Um, and I can share more in the coming weeks as we get closer to that, like putting in more time, stories of, um, that would inspire you towards this. There's a lot of stories I have that will just inspire you towards like the outcomes from, for something like this and how the benefit that it has in one's life. Um, but I think suffice it to say for, for this week, we've got it. When you, go, when you finish going through this booklet, like for this week, what you come up with is something you can keep with you. Like you could take this hand and put it up on your wall and you could, you could like for the first quarter of the year, you could come back to that once a week and just look at it and just, rem- you know, just sit in the presence of God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's so close. And these are the access points, you know. The good news, you know, what is it that I... That I, the, the kind of person I see God's transforming me into that I'm becoming what are the limiting beliefs you know what's the, 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 the agreement that I'm coming to and all this and then what's one little thing when you get to the pinky you're going to love that what's one little thing I can do today now I'll tell you I know Deborah's done this I've done this myself um, I took a whole three months and did the hand every single day for five minutes I would just do every day I would just remind myself this is what I'm grateful for. This is the kind of person I want to become. This is, these are the lies that, that keep coming against me saying that I can't become that. This is the, you know, the, the, um, the, the surrendering that I'm doing to, to the Spirit of God. I'm just surrendering. I can't control everything, but I can control my surrender to God. And then one little thing I'm going to do today that lives this out, just one little thing, and just every day, five minutes. So, yeah. Whew. I'm so glad all of you were here today, that you braved the cold. It would have been miserable if it had just been me here by myself. <laughs> so grateful that all of you are here and we're, we're in a new year. Um, and who, who knows what's, get, what's in store for us this year? Come on. The serendipity of the Spirit. We have no way of knowing the glorious miracles that are going to happen this year. But we can anticipate and we can live in excitement. Let me send you out with a blessing, if you don't mind standing. This is Ellie's favorite part of the service. Ellie lives with this, this benediction. She lives with the, They live with this benediction for like days on end.
<laughs> when it comes to benediction, Ellie is like a sponge, like just, just ready to just absorb every single blessing that comes out of it. May the Lord bless and keep you. May his gospel give you peace. May his spirit fill you with joy. May you be his disciples, making disciples. May his face shine upon you. And may you be courageous ones receiving his kingdom in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Greet one another. Happy New Year. So good to see you all.